I'm not called to save the world, right? Like I am right. called to accompany you and to ask for accompaniment as I try to be a better, a better human being. Welcome to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel, a podcast that illuminates the path to collective healing at the intersection of science and mysticism. In his conversations with visionaries, innovators, artists, and healers, Thomas invites guests into a relational experience that allows inspiration and innovation to emerge. This is The Point of Relation. The following interview was recorded during a previous Collective Trauma Summit, an online gathering convened annually by Thomas Hubel to share ideas and inspire action for healing, individual, ancestral, and collective trauma. Visit CollectiveTraumaSummit.com to listen to featured talks from our most recent summit and sign up to be the first to know when the next summit is announced. Krista Tippett is a Peabody Award-winning broadcaster. National Humanities Medalist, and New York Times best-selling author. She hosts the On Being public radio show and podcast, curates the Civil Conversations Project, and founded and leads the On Being Project, a nonprofit media and public life initiative that pursues deep thinking and moral imagination, social courage, and joy towards the renewal of inner life, outer life, and life together. Krista grew up in a small town in Oklahoma, attended Brown University, worked as a journalist and diplomat in the Cold War in Berlin, and later received a Master of Divinity from Yale University. She was awarded a National Humanities Medal from President Obama. Her books are entitled Speaking of Faith, Einstein's God, and Becoming Wise, an Inquiry into the Mystery and Art of Living. So welcome back to the Collective Trauma Summit. My name is Thomas Hübel, and uh, I'm delighted to sit here with one of the most amazing interviewers herself, Krista Tippett. So Krista, very warm welcome to our summit. I'm happy you joined us. Thank you. <laughs> and um, so you're leading many voices through very deep, conversations and and i think you're and i think that's something we both share that relations and conversations are like a means for healing are like an environment for healing and i would love you know you given you went through so many of those conversations and uh, you learned a lot through them i guess so what what's healing when we have when we say we have conversations because many people have conversations i don't know if they're really healing. So what's yeah. what makes a conversation a, mm. a healing environment? Let's start maybe with that. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, first of all, I'm I'm happy to be with you. I've I've been hearing about this summit for a long time. And as I said to you, I I, you know, I'm not an expert in trauma, but I'm very happy to offer what what you think I have to offer. Um I think, you know, one thing when we speak about trauma, I, I do think that it's true in the States, for example, that we think we can talk everything away that we've, that we've, uh, right. And we have very much, um, often resolved, resolve things kind of chin up cerebrally. And I, I think we're learning, we're getting so much more sophistication in, in many fields, um, about how so much is in our bodies, even feelings and 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 um, what we haven't identified with our bodies. So I don't think that words solve everything. I just I think it's important to say that. I think there are experiences um, that def that defy words. And some of the most important experiences and insights and even convictions that we have are are beyond what words can touch. And yet, there can be something so, transformative it can be a breakthrough to put words around something that we've never named before right so there is a power of naming that is in in all the great traditions 
you know, it's, it's in the Aboriginal song lines. It's in the Genesis story that, that somehow by, by giving things names, we, they, they come into being. And I think that's also an experience we have internally that when we're not naming things, we can't actually be, be present to them. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not true of everything, but it's true of much. I grew up in a family that was very busily not talking about any of the important things that needed to be discussed. And yet they were, they infused everything we did. They were in the middle of the room at all times. And I think that my commitment to conversation and my love of conversation um, comes from this desire not to live that way. And, uh, and yet I also think that the quality of a conversation is so important, right? I mean, words are incredibly powerful and they can be used as weapons and they can be used to simplify and dismiss um, but they can also be used to elevate and they can be used to open and they can be generative. And so, you know, my, my passion is, is, is opening conversations um, that, yeah, that give voice to what deeply wants to be given voice to. And, but there's care, right? It's not, it's not just about passing words between ourselves. It's about creating a conversational space. It's about, it's about speaking together differently so that we may live together differently. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, so eloquent. I have also a quote that I want to read later, the one that you said. But before, like, how do we, in your understanding, how do we create a space for, mm-hmm. like, a caring or a compassionate or a space at all where some things will be said that maybe wouldn't have been said? You know, yeah. what makes the space conducive to for things, deep things to emerge? I, I think this matter of of creating a space is as important now as it ever has been. We have so many different forms and platforms for using our words, for coming into dialogue or conversation, but a lot of them are um and i don't want to i don't want to use the easy language of not safe spaces right they're they're not um they might they might truly not be safe spaces um but they're also framed i believe so strongly that the intention that we invest in whatever we do uh shapes everything that happens there and that is very much true of a conversational space uh, you know, some of the ways to talk about the qualities that make a difference, some of the words to use would be, is it hospitable? The hospitality is an important value to me. And, you know, I like hospitality because it, uh, you know, it's a great virtue. It's one of the great virtues. And also every human culture, human cultures have this deep, deep, sophisticated a way of being hospitable in many ways of being hospitable and it's always humanizing um and it's always embodied as much as it is any kind of attitude right so and the thing i like about hospitality too which i think um isn't conveyed if 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 that word gets thrown thrown around in a superficial way is that hospitality does not mean you you can be hospitable towards someone without knowing them or without even without loving them or even without liking them it's not a precondition of hospitality that you agree on everything or that you are alike but what it does and i i think i think of hospitality as really a social technology that has been developed forever in human cultures and 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 it is about bringing your own best self uh, and inviting someone else to bring their best self into the room, yeah. So that 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 would that would be you know some of the ways I would start to think about that. Mm. It's beautiful because um, this reminds me, you know, Abraham in the Bible, his his virtue was hospitality with his tent that was always open for everybody. Yes, 
And yeah. uh, William and I, William Yuri and I are friends, so we did some courses together. And so we often talk about hospitality. What's the meaning of, like, the deeper meaning, the, yeah. the essential meaning of hospitality? That's great that, that you brought that. And if you if you say, okay, hospitality is one virtue. What are other virtues that you would see that are important uh, in your work? Um, in my work, um, well, another one that I would that I think lives alongside hospitality uh, would be humility. But by that, I don't mean a simplistic um, humility that is about debasing myself, right? I, I think that humility as a spiritual virtue in its deep sen sense is not about me getting small. It's about me uh, greeting you with a, 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 a desire and an expectation that you will surprise me. It's about wanting others to be big. Mm -hmm. And it's about then again, creating the space or the atmosphere, presenting myself. So that becomes more likely. So that does also have to say, have to do with me honoring you so that you can relax, so that you can inhabit your body. Yeah. Humility. Uh, I, care very much about the wholeness of human beings. And I also am aware that a lot in our collective life, you know, I think Western civilization and, you know, the enlightenment plays its part in this religion has played its part in this. We've, we're very compartmentalized, you know, we go to work and we show certain parts of ourselves. We're at home and we show certain parts of ourselves. Um, I very much, um, I mean, it, you know, you. I think you you asked like, what are the qualities important in my work? I really care about the life of the mind, um, the life of the mind, and and the imagination and creativity that is in, in, involved in that. That's something that in American culture is often not invited, and 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 what I mean by that also is not a certain kind of trained intellect. And I think this is different culture to culture, but in the U.S., we're just we're very comfortable with our, bringing our emotions into a space, right? It's just very it's it's, it's very easy um, and familiar to do that. Um, and I um, care about creating spaces also where people can bring their ideas and um, and their aspirations and. And yes, their, their, their ability to think critically, but, but, but also their ability to think creatively. Um, and it's, it, that may not sound so special, but it's kind of countercultural here. And, you know, I lived in Germany where you are from. And so I also know that in Germany, it's often, it can be the other way around, right? <laughs> that people are very free with their intellect and it's a diff it's a more countercultural move to join that um, okay. with yeah. what we call heart, which really the way we use the word heart, you know, even in the spiritual traditions, is really about imagination as much as it is about feelings. Mm. Beautiful. I loved your framing of uh, humility as as letting yourself be surprised by somebody else. Yeah. That's yeah. lovely. I think to be able to live in that surprise and not try to control the space and yeah. be open for something completely new. And that's, that's lovely. I okay. like it very much. I want to read something to you. I mean, the, to you that um, quotes something that I really liked when I read it. First of all, it's, it's very eloquent, but I think it's also very deep. I, I will read that sentence and then I'll ask you something about it. Mm -hmm. And from, from your Better Conversations guide, I have seen that wisdom in life and society emerges precisely through those moments when we have to hold seemingly opposing realities in a creative tension and interplay. Power and fragility, birth and death, pain and hope, beauty and brokenness, mystery and conviction, calm and fierceness, mine and yours. Mm -hmm. And it's very lovely. I, first of all, I love poetic ways of expressions, but it's also it's also deep. And it seems like that you, like, because I, I agree very much with uh, that wisdom arises when we can be in a conversational space where there is friction or the opposing mm -hmm. forces, or 
With other words, where there is the polarization that is a signpost of a deeper traumatization. Yeah. Because trauma creates always two. Yeah. And, you know, healing trauma creates presence. Yeah. So I'm wondering, like, when you when you hear that sentence and um, what's in you that, that uh, wrote that? <laughs> yeah. Like what's the experience, how you came to that sentence? Because to me, it feels very resonant when I read it. Yeah, thank you for reading that. That's, that's an important um, passage for me from my own writing. But it's also... It's also one of those passages that I, you know, there can be a, a magic to writing, which is for me not there 99.99% of the time, but every once in a while there's something that feels like it wrote itself and you say, you know, I, did, I didn't know I knew this. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that was definitely one of those passages. Yeah, I think, uh, again, for me, there's, there's an aspect of of a rebellion in what I do because I grew up in a world that wanted everything to be very clear. And there was what was right and wrong, you know, this and that or that. Um, and certainties that weren't true to the fullness of reality. And um, I guess some of the things I've learned in the intervening years is that this is an inclination of our brains and our bodies. We, we, we crave certainty and it's understandable. Um, and in fact, our brains are working very hard to take care of us, right? As they, as they, as they, as they lead us in that direction. And then I would say, you know, with other, so that is, that is coming to us from science. I think another scientific idea from the, from physics that I've, that to me, you know, merges with all of that is this idea of complementarity, and you know that that there can be different answers to a, to the same question. There can be two completely different answers, and 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 what that depends on is the question you ask of it. So with Einstein, it was is light a particle or a wave, and it turns out it is both. But you could only see that if you were asking the right the question. You could, it was it depends on the question which answer you get of the same reality. So I think actually that, yeah, we do this very binary. We, we like, we like polarities, we like certainty, but I, I think this is a very deep subject. I think that how we navigate this century, uh, whether we have any chance of flourishing civilizationally or whether we merely survive has to do with outgrowing this, this binary diminishing way that we that we see reality and take it on and just as you said it's it's you know so much well so much of what is true civilizationally collectively is also true for the individual mm -hmm. to be whole to really reside in our wholeness we we have to see we have to acknowledge and somehow befriend um not just that which is complex in us but that which is contradictory mm -hmm. um, and yet all of that adds up to who we are and all of that, if we can see it, if we can befriend it, uh, is also our field of possibility and of, of potential growth. Mm. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And uh, uh, one function of maturity as I look at it is, is exactly what you said that we are able yeah. to hold contradictions. Yeah. They don't end without the stress to having to resolve yeah. them. Yeah. Just be a space for it. And that's, that's yeah. a very powerful quality that mm -hmm. often gets dismissed. As you said, I need to know what's right or wrong. I need to, you know, I need to eliminate one pole in order yeah. to stick with the other. So that's, I think that's a sign of maturity that you mentioned, like how we... There's a, there's a, the, I interviewed this Nobel physicist, Frank Wilczek, a couple of years ago, and we, we talked about this complementarity idea. And he said something that I always carry with me that, um, that if you're talking about a deep truth, now he's talking about a deep scientific truth, but I think it's true of a deep human truth as well. It's opposite is also true. And I think that if we can, um, even think about our deepest truths and kind of play out that thought exercise. It, you know, 
it that kind of exercise would be terrifying to our to our primitive brains that are trying to take care of us. Um, and yet, um, we expand when we can even momentarily take that in and let that be true. And the possibility of who we can be expands. Right. Yeah, I see a lot in in the in the parts where that's difficult. Because I think what you are speaking to, like, is our let's say whole nature. Mm, that's yeah. that's what we do when when we feel integrated. But often we don't feel integrated because the the past, like unintegrated history, is kind of creating symptoms all the time, and that's what. That's why we also do the summit is like, because I look at trauma like it's thousands of years of history that are mm -hmm. already traumatized, not just my personal experience yeah. that is traumatizing, but it's a whole, you know, ocean of trauma that we have been born into. And then we are in these families that and the yeah. ancestors. And, and so, and I'm wondering how much, you know, the parts of our brain that freak out when, when we don't have certainty are based on a lot of pain that is stored in our nervous systems yeah. over a long period of time. And that's why that flourishing sometimes seems so hard. And I'm wondering, what, what do you think about that? Yes, and I what you just said also about that it's in our nervous system. I mean, that's really what I was pointing at. I think this is a new awareness we have. And what an exciting time to be alive that we understand that. Mm -hmm. um, because if we understand it, then we can face it, right? And we can find tools to approach it. And we are finding those tools. And, and that's where, you know, words alone um, can't touch that. But naming that, naming that and knowing it is the path to transformation. Yeah, I think I think um in in 2020 uh actually right before the pandemic um uh broke out um where I live uh I had an interview with a Resma Menicum who is um also a, a um works with trauma and works specifically with racialized trauma in the body and you know, I, I I mean, I have had some conversations about all of this across the years about how our our approach to trauma and understanding of it has very rapidly evolved. I mean, you're part of this in just in the last couple of decades, which is just no time at all. And um, from kind of PTSD, you know, and 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 I think a lot of the science started with with people coming back from war, um, as you said, just a very widespread experience. And, but I think this conversation I had with Resmaa Menachem and the way he's worked with this, this, this is a, this is a true addition to our sense of, um, of our racial history and the reckoning that is upon us. Uh, and it's, it's painful to take this in how much we have been carrying around in our bodies and very particularly, you know, of the legacy of slavery and of um, just generation upon generation of trauma being inflicted in vast ways and in constant, subtle ways. And it helps, you know, I think in this country, there's this for white people there's this and not for the whole society there's this sense of mm, see i think there was this sense that we came out of the 60s and 70s and there was a civil rights movement and and there was change there was change but then this 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 confusion and and puzzlement at you know we we thought we were farther along than we were and why didn't that stick Right? Why? Why do those now appear as such baby steps? And you know, we have so far to travel just to be who we say we are as a nation. Um, and I think that this new understanding of trauma in the body helps explain that, and it gives us a new way to work on it. And you know, Resva Menachem he talks about how white bodies 
carry these generations of trauma, right? And the people who came to the United States were very often early on, were you know, and now t- were very were fleeing uh, their own traumas, and then they did this terrible thing that human beings do, which is inflicted it on others, on other bodies. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, first of all, I love Rizma's work, and I deeply think it's very true and resonant. And anyway, I think trauma can only be resolved through the body. I think yeah. that's a deep truth, as you said. And um, and I love because here, first of all, I love listening to you because you transmit like a deep, like your deep humanity when you speak. So I feel I feel that when you speak, mm. and um, and I think that also connects to what you said much earlier on is why, like when words and the transmission of what we speak about are the same. Then it's not just talking about. Yeah. Then it's transmitting something into the space, and that's a completely different speaking. So when I listened to you, I felt I felt you as a human being participate in the racial questions as you spoke about it, and I think that's where where the baby steps really how we embody those to really make that our reality. You know, when we can walk our talk, yeah. then it becomes real. Yeah. And I think that's completely true. We need to learn to embody this through the layers of trauma that are ingrained in our bodies and nervous systems. That's very true. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. So when you, because there, you already started to speak about it, because one definitely vast collective trauma field is yeah. like we are living, you know, in, in the U.S., 400 years of slavery or a Native American genocide. If you look yeah. into Germany, you know, I know you lived in Germany for some time, but just looking at the, at the Second World War, yeah. a Holocaust, like a catastrophe, a humanitarian, yeah. like in humanity, like most probably one of the bigger catastrophes ever. Yeah. And, and, then, and then on top of it, you had a, a split. Uh, between east and west that was like a patch on a deep open wound yeah and and i'm wondering when you like these are two and the world's full of it but i think that is maybe the closest to us right now um how how do you how do you see us addressing such deep wounds yeah and how did you experience for example when you lived in germany how did how was your felt experience of being in a country that had an, a, a huge open wound and then another one on top of it, you know, like yeah. the, the separation of East and West. I'm, I'm just wondering, what was your experience of that? Yeah, well, in, in that context, um, in the context of the, the, reckon, the wrestling with history and with trauma, um, you know, when I, when I wrote the Becoming Wise book, I... I kind of looked inside myself and, you know, I, so what, so what I'm going to talk about now is not something I was aware of when, when I was there, but I realized that for me coming, I had grown up, I grew up in a, in, in a small town in Oklahoma, a state. I mean, in some ways this is true of every part of the United States, but Oklahoma very much was a place where people came fleeing the past and also a place that was at the end of the Trail of Tears, which is it's one of these horrendous traumas that uh, in, that is part of the history of this country. And I and I, you know, I my grandfather's family came in a covered wagon, and you know that's the closest I was to to that side of the story. And that there was also just unbelievable poverty and misery. Um, and and so, but and yet, what happened in Oklahoma? This is a big generalization, but I, I, it's a place where history was kind of erased. It's it's a place where people came fleeing history, and then we just never talked about it again. No one knew. I never knew anybody who asked the question, "Where did your ancestors come from? Where did your family come from?" You go to other parts of the U.S. You go to other places in the world. So history was just about one layer deep. And it's a very unnatural and unhealthy 
way to live. I think there was something in me that when I went to Germany, and you're right, I mean, there's no place where there are more dramatic layers upon layer of history and trauma. But in 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 they were all, especially, you know, I was there in the 80s, um, 40 years after the war, and that history, it had all been kind of brought to the surface. And I think there was something for me that was riveting about that encountering that constant, you know, there was, it was almost, there was almost a masochistic element to it, right. Of, you know, constantly confronting the worst thing your ancestors did. But, you know, I was there at an interesting time in an interesting, so I was born in 1960. My, um, Generate, can I ask when you were born? 71. 71. Okay. So, see, you're so my generation of Germans and a little older, but you may not have experienced this like 10 years later. You know, Otto Schilly, and also I won't name this. There there are these people who were, were, were coming into respectability, but and and later would be, would be would be kind of, you know, the official German state, right? (laughs) So what I saw in Germany was the thing that happens in every place where there's collective trauma is the first generation can barely speak about it, right? Right. And that's that's always true. There are no words and it is not transmitted. And then it's kind of discovered by the next generation. And then you get to this grandchildren generation and they're really the ones who throw up their hands and say, you know, you lied to us. This is so terrible. And I was there as that dynamic was playing. It's about people don't remember this. They don't remember that there were terroristic acts against bankers and right. There was this literally violent reaction against um, the legacy of that still alive in West German society. It was very dramatic. And so it's interesting to me when people now speak about um, of Germany as this enlightened place that, that spent a long time learning history and reckoning with it. I also know that there that that was a messy multi chapter story and we don't remember it that so it's hard work again it's hard work in a family but what i want to tell you also is when you ask me that question here's the memory that comes to mind um in 1985 86 maybe Elie Wiesel who really you know, who's, who survived Auschwitz, who lost his family to Auschwitz, who really told the story of the Holocaust. Um, and he, you know, his work and his book Night in particular was an offering of telling the story before it had been told as much as it, as it has now. And he came to Berlin. And my memory is that it was the first time he had come to Berlin or maybe perhaps to Germany since the Holocaust. And I was a New York Times stringer and he, he asked, he was having all kinds of formal meetings and he asked to meet with some young Germans, 20 something Germans. It was just my age. And, and I, I wasn't, wasn't, I can't, I don't know if I was, I think, I don't know if I was in the room or if, if journalists weren't allowed, but when they came out, I will never forget what he said, which is, he said, it had never occurred to me that it could be as painful to be the children of the people who ran the camps as it is to be a child of those who died in them. And I mean, that is such a huge statement for some, for a Holocaust survivor, but that is the truth of all of our, of our traumas. And it's too much to ask much of the time or most of the time for the victims to have that compassion, right? Or for the society to have that compassion. But somehow this matter of attending to the humanity and working to heal the humanity of perpetrators, of the perpetrators of violence, as much as the humanity of those who are harmed, 
is the only way that that they're not that that not only that healing takes place, but the, you can have transformation so that the same dynamics aren't repeated. And you know that is almost, as I say, that's almost too much to take in, and it's not work necessarily, or obviously that needs to be done by the people in the front line of the suffering. But I think about. I think about American society and, you know, we are really understanding that this punitive society that we have, that our entire way of incarceration is so flawed and that we are just, it's just a, it's just a factory for more damage and more violence. And I think this is, so I think what all of this points at is one of the ways that we're being called communally to yeah, I want to use that language again to grow up. I kind of think that if our species survives, you know, a hundred years from now, we we have we I think we came into the 20th century in the West, especially thinking that we were just so sophisticated and really had almost solved all the problems. And you know, at best, we are in an ugly adolescence. But adolescents have a lot of creativity. That's right. That's right. No, I completely agree. Like there are so many points that you said that I could uh, continue with. Like first of all, I I love to again to feel your transmission, like what mm. you radiate when you speak, and and I very much resonate with what you said about the pain that descendants of former, you know, yeah, Nazis in Germany. Uh, and perpetrators really feel. I saw this in in many of the group. We did large scale events on the Holocaust integration in in Germany and also Germany with Israel. Yeah. And it's exactly that. We, I was in rooms like where you know descendants and concentration camp uh, survivors were sitting in the same room, yeah. and but in a in a sort of presence to really nakedly listen to exactly what you described right now, mm-hmm. and the touching or the tremendous amount of healing that can happen you know if you in this massive trauma field is incredible it's incredible it's exactly what you said i i experienced this many times so it's it's true and the question is and i also resonate a lot with the adolescents because i really think it's a maturation question when we spoke before about holding contradictions this you can do only when you're in a certain state of maturity in your own development and um and so i i i think that's right so when you Take everything you you shared right now, and you look at, for example, if you applied it to the states, to the like, and we look at the racial divide and the uh, traumatization and uh, you know structural yeah. violence that's still happening, and uh, what what's a way in your understanding, also what you learned, you know, through all the conversations and through your own life, how? How can we make a difference when sometimes it feels so hard and polarized that there's hardly conversation happening? Yeah. So what what what's the next step? Yeah. Well, it's you know it's it's also it's a in in some ways that that German situation of knowing who the perpetrators were and knowing who the victims were and having to reckon with that. Um, there was nothing simple about that, but it looks simpler than the situation we have, which is the way this violence, this, this violent dehumanizing way of being has been woven through all of our lives and all of our structures unacknowledged as such for the most part. And I, you know, I, I have a lot of humility about, you know, what, what I know or what, what I, you know, I, I don't, I don't have solutions. I, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a, I wouldn't call it a debate. There's a thing that's happening here now. I, you know, there's a critique that a lot of the racial reckoning is happening at this individual level and, and that that's not enough. And that's true. It's not enough. But as a white person, I, also think that um 
I, I think there, and, and Resmo would say this too in his own way, that I think there's work, and, and this is less sexy than the kind of racial encounter that is the obvious step, right? The less sexy and just as necessary thing is for white people to get together with other white people and um, figure out how we transform ourselves. But, but what I mean by that is, you know, there's actually, actually, I would use the word bigotry of some white, well, of white people over against each other. And I don't categorize myself as a liberal or progressive, although that is, you know, a lot of the world I live in looks like that. And the thing I'm worried about right now is a sense of superiority among people who, who lose nothing by saying that calling themselves anti-racist and sacrifice nothing by professing solidarity. When what is called for is that we start questioning really basic decisions we make about where we live and what we buy and where we send our children to school. And when you start, when it starts being about that matter of the, for the future, you start planning for your child, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road. That is existential. And so I actually believe that, um, you know, one of the things white people are doing in this country now is feeling a little bit better about themselves sometimes because those white people are even worse. But I think. I, I think there's a, I think we're standing on pretty level ground. I think that those of us who call ourselves anti-racist and lead comfortable lives, even if we're out at protests, are on pretty level ground with people who are waving Confederate flags in terms of our complicity with the way we've been living. And so, and this is generations ahead of us that we have to take this apart. So. So, yeah, I guess I, yeah, I think we have to start inside ourselves. I actually think meaningful social change always has an inward component. And when it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't stick. Um, so I think there is an inward component and there's a pragmatic cultural component. But it, I can't, I, you know, I don't have any kind of big prescription for anybody else. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> that's already so much <laughs> you said so much you know like various things in the last two questions like that you spoke to we could expand into a book like there's so much in there um, <laughs> that you said also the what does it mean to call myself anti-racist and then to continue living my life pretty yeah. much in the same way and yeah. what does it mean to in a way uh declare solidarity and and elevate myself and and lose the eye to eye level because i think yeah. now like these things are very very important i think like how what really all the ways that help me not to feel the situation that we are in yeah and those are all ways like of compensating these are all ways of you know or can be used as ways of compensating. It can also be used to go really deep. But when I go really deep, it's it will be recognizable. Mm -hmm. But not because I say it, because it changes my life. And I think that's that's very important what you mentioned, that what really supports me to feel the situation that we are in. Because I, I don't think that there's any kind of change. And you said it beautifully, as long as we don't have the yeah. internal change, the external yeah. change won't stick. Yeah. And that's what we saw in history over and over again. Yeah. And uh, and I, I deeply believe that that's true. But I also believe that as long as I don't am not able to feel something, I won't make the change necessary. Mm -hmm. it needs and to that's what true. happened in 2020. And in particular, with the killing of George Floyd in my city of Minneapolis, where I live now, um, I think, I mean, not those exact circumstances, but what happened to George Floyd has happened before. And in fact, it's happened since. But I think that we had almost all, all at the same time, just been softened by that virus you know, setting us down on the ground of reality and 
and making our our existential frailty and finitude you know just forcing us to an awareness of that that we that we most of the time succeed in not taking in and so i think what happened there the horror of it and the complicity of it was felt and i want so badly you know my greatest fear about the period ahead as we all as we get vaccinated is that we lose that we let that scar over and we stop letting ourselves feel it and we stop letting it drive us but i do think enough of us want to be true to what we were given to see and to do and also that we have to to know that this is that this was generations centuries in the making and it's going to be generations in the remaking Beautiful, beautiful. And I think given like the latest virus resurging, like uh, the surges that are coming up and uh, and also what we see right now with the climate, I think that yeah. what you speak, to, the, the two virtues that you spoke to at the beginning, hospitality mm. and humility, yeah. I think like the virus also, you know, made us a little bit more humble. Yeah. <laughs> To see that our lives are not just that safe and given and successful, that there, there is, you know, it, it showed us the impermanence of things, and um, and also it will, we will need a lot of more hospitality, yeah, with each other, you know, amongst each other, in order to go through the time that's coming. Also, with the, yeah. you know, you see all the the climate changes and so, so I think that that's very beautiful. What what you said about the that it made us a little bit more vulnerable and open yeah. to really let something go in and and feel it. Uh, I think that's beautiful. How can since spirituality and like a deeper spiritual internal anchor is is important? So can you speak a little bit to how that's important in in meeting those questions? Does this have any relevance in meeting racism, or yeah. why some why didn't it express that stronger in the in the last centuries? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm so fascinated and committed to supporting the connection between inner life and outer presence in the world, and. You know, I'm not. I, I'm really so disinterested in disembodied spirituality again in western cultures we we you know we we this is another these are other compartments we're we're either acting or we're going inside we're 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 you know we're doers and we're making things happen um but we and we actually get much more training for that we we get lots of formation for our external presentation, our exterior, uh, you know, action and how we make our way through the world, um, in, internal formation has been treated like you know an optional thing. Now, in previous generations, you know, even fifty or a hundred years ago, um, you know, religion was not perfect, but but if, and in most human societies there've always been these places of spiritual formation and 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 even if there was a lot to reject in that there there were things that were given right there were rituals and there were texts and there was community and there were spiritual mentors and in a very short period of time in some of the world you suddenly all at once really um, have new humans coming into the world with absolutely no spiritual formation, not even anything to reject, right? That that's also been part of the spiritual path and the religious, you know, an interesting religious life. What do you what do you question? And, and you know, yeah, if we and I, you know, and I think that I I think that when you look at the 20th century and you know, it's and if you look at the civil rights movement, for example, the the people who led that who changed the world had such profound religious underpinnings and mm -hmm. also they were visionary i mean martin luther king junior was a 
was a was a minister, was a Christian minister, but he was also took as his mentor Thich Nhat Hanh and um, you know Gandhi and um, Howard Thurman, who's this who was really kind of the the chaplain, the theologian of the civil rights movement, forgotten, but this incredible figure who feels more like a 21st century figure. You know, he went to India. He was the first one of the first African American visitors to India that, that they had experienced. And he, he was changed and he helped bring that lineage um, into the civil rights movement. But then as they succeeded, you know, laws were changed. And there was this 20th century equation that if you change the laws, you change the society. But I think we didn't change ourselves. And so, right, and laws can be unmade. And that is, you know, we're seeing that in very literal ways. It's not that there wasn't progress and, and none of the civil rights elders who are still with us would say there wasn't progress, but a lot of progress has been rolled back. And, you know, somebody like Brian Stevenson will say there's an argument that mass incarceration is, you know, is what slavery became. Um, it's the it's the continuation of that impulse and that that essential dehumanization, um, and that system is also now is also dehumanizing people of every color that that come in contact with it. It dehumanizes our entire society. I think I, you know I just kind of went off on a tangent, but I but I but I'm just saying like I I think that that we that we that we don't bear in mind this connection between the inner and outer life at our peril. And so when I when I'm talking about interior life, that is part of the context for me. And that is not to say that there's not work we do that is is interior, right? I mean, I think we have our contemplative practices help us ground us, gr get grounded inside ourselves. And 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 you know, I'm I'm a I would say <laughs> I haven't talked about this so much um, in public, but I. I actually think meditation and mindfulness and Buddhism, that these traditions are part of the key to whether we grow up, as we've been talking about. And they're not the only way to be spiritual. There's a, there's something happening in, in progressive circles now and in Silicon Valley, where I spent some time a couple of years ago. Um, the, the ways that human beings um, are spiritual and, and practice uh, religion and um, and make contact with what is transcendent and honor mystery and and honor the question of who we will be to each other, which is to me as much what our traditions at their best pursue as any as who God is. It's who we will be to each other. Um, and you know, you mentioned the environmental crisis. I also think that. That we in our in the we we in modernity have made of the natural world an other. Exactly. And therefore we are exploitative and violent and disconnected. And so, you know, that reconnection is is not it is has its its kinship with the with the racial uh, awakening. Very much. Yeah. So, I mean, but so I had just said something really complicated all over the board, but, you know, my working definition of spirituality is befriending reality. And, and, and this kind of circles all the way back to where you and I started befriending reality in all its complexity, in its danger, in its beauty, in its contradiction. And our traditions give us ways um, and, and, and some of, and I, and not just our religious traditions, you know, the tra tradition of psychology. I mean, some of our sciences give us ways to, to meet and navigate and unfold and live gracefully with that fullness. Beautiful. And that is in, it is every bit as much interior as it is exterior, right? There's, it, it, it is then a whole. Right, it's so lovely to listen to you. I really enjoy it. Like a, <laughs> like a uh, balsam, it's like nice, mm -hmm. nice, very nourishing. And it's um, and and I again deeply resonate with two two things you said, like a, a lot of things that you said. I resonate, but I think the importance of the inner spiritual dimension 
in in many of the change impulses that we saw in history yeah. that really made a difference. And I think that's still undervalued how many, you know, genius people or people that really brought about change also had a deep spiritual anchor yeah. in themselves. And that realigning with that mystical or mystery inside of us is is the engine to bring change when especially when it's hard. And the other one I also want to underline that um that how we made from nature another, yeah. I think it's the same thing, like how we are disconnected from our bodies because my body yeah. is the planet. Yeah. And if I can't feel my body, I have yeah. to other nature. And and I think that was a very profound uh, sentence you said. Uh, beautiful. I completely agree also with the way you look at um, the, the importance of the spiritual impulse. And I like the, the phrase like befriending reality. It's a very nice, it's a lovely, <laughs> lovely definition. Beautiful. And um, given I see the time, our time here, I, I could listen to you much, much longer. I really <laughs> enjoy the conversation it's so deep and it's beautiful to see like uh, where you're coming from and also what you transmit when you speak. It's beautiful. Okay. And um, is there anything that, well, before we wrap up, is there anything that you think is important to add to the conversation um, about, you know, your work, about collective trauma, about how we how we meet those realities right now, or how we befriend uh, the realities that are uh, estranged? Well, I've I've really enjoyed this too. Um, I I might just say that. I've been noticing this language of trauma kind of taking its place in our midst. And some of the qualities of very young humans now, which, which can be really uncomfortable for institutions and workplaces, <laughs> there is this intolerance for what has been not just been tolerated, but kind of built into this expectation of terrible things happening and people just getting on with it, right? Which really has happened in the everyday and, and, and in dramatic ways and again, more subtle ways. And what young people, I mean, it's just so interesting to me. It's, it's like we have this generation that is born that just suddenly has this, we, we've made ourselves so numb, right? For such a long time. And it's like this generation born without that numbness and resistant to being trained into it and, and probably kind of extreme in their, in their sensitivity to it. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a reaction mm -hmm. and to something that's been wrong and to, you know, more than an irritant to something um, so skewed uh, in the way we've been living. And and I do think that this somehow this naming and this embracing what this is and then delving into it. And this summit is, you know, one of those places that's happening. I, I really do think it's one of the most important things that's happening in our midst. And, and we will see how it teaches us and how you right, how we how we change. Mm, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I also love. What you said now, it's just underlining some things that I really like, but I think that they are really key elements of, of that uh, collective healing process is also that the process is teaching us where it's going. Yeah. yeah. And to be open to that kind of feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And that, that feedback loop can only land in us when we are not numb, but when we feel mm -hmm. it. And, and I think being guided by the process is another amazing virtue. Um, yeah. I think the process yeah. and uh, you gave um uh the participants of the summit like access to your new app do you want to yeah. just say if you work <laughs> why and what's what's yes what's i can't believe app? that i have an app um we're talking right as this is just out in the world it's not something i ever um aspired to and it came along and it sounds so cheesy the wisdom app but i found it an amazing platform to um 
you know, I'm in a bit of a different role in the app. I'm drawing on my conversations that I've had across the years, but I'm, and I'm always in them as a learner. And then I'm, I'm in, and I'm in the app. So this is course based. And the first course is on hope as a muscle. Um, and I think hope is, um, you know, hope, a, a, a reality based, um, vibrant hope is a quality of every person I've ever admired, right? It is a, it is a quality of admirable lives and, and wise lives. And yet there are a lot of stereotypes about there's, there are simplifications of what hope is. It's not wishful thinking. This is not an empty Mm -hmm. idealism. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it, you know, it, it, it has real world consequences. And it's also, it's about our presence inside ourselves and it's about our presence to the world. It's everything we've been talking about. And I've found this. So I get to be in the app, both as a learner and teacher. um, And it's an offering that it really is the offering that's come out of this year for me and for on being. And it's very much um, coming out of this this phenomenon you and I have been speaking of about how do we stay true to what we've been given to learn? It's so hard and the work ahead is so long. And it's so, it, it asks, it, it, I think it, it asks and invites us not just to be engaged in um, big change, but to change the way we move through our days and all of our interactions. And, and yet when we, None of the virtue, none of the great virtues. We're not called to any of the great virtues to do them alone, right? That's such a such a survival of fittest, like 20th century, you know, it's such an American thing. Mm-hmm. I'm not called to save the world, right? Like I am right, called right. to accompany you and to ask for accompaniment as I try to be a better, a better human being. Mm-hmm. And so, so that's what this experience is about. So we, we're calling it a community of accompaniment and we are going to create experiences for people to come together. But what I mean by that also fundamentally mm-hmm. is if we create this, um, these sessions where we learn from people who live like this and in a very granular way, what are the ingredients of that? And it's a different ingredient from Brian Stevenson or Jane Goodall or, you know, I Jen Poo or Brother David Stendhal Rost, but we take in, you know, what are the ingredients? And then, and that's, this is a beautiful thing we're learning through science, like what you practice, you become. And that's also true of qualities of character. So what if, what if we all start practicing these qualities of character at the same time where we live and have that kind of community of accompaniment? That's how the world changes. It's, it's, it's never been top down until the very end. And in this world, in this 21st century world, you know, we have to look at ourselves and each other, the people Beautiful. beside us. Yeah. Mm, beautiful. Lovely. No, that sounds amazing. Also, how hope is a way of living and it's not mm. a reductionistic form no. of, of denial of our lives, but it's it's the way we are connected to our inner, inner engine and that spreads hope. That's beautiful. Mm. Krista, it's amazing. As I said, I would love to continue much longer. Yeah, I hope we'll meet in person one of these days. But the technology is miraculous. Miraculous. Uh, how could yeah. we ever have to be uh, 6,000 yeah. miles apart, most probably? Yeah. And it's, it's amazing. And also, it's amazing how much we can feel each other. And yes, like, I agree. What to say, yeah. And it's amazing. So sa- thank you so much. It was really, really deep. And um, I enjoyed every moment listening well, to you. Blessings. You're as I said, to I'm honored to be here. And this is a really important forum. Mm. So thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Visit CollectorTraumaSummit.com to listen to more talks like this one and to sign up and be the first to know when the next Collector Trauma Summit is announced. Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, pointofrelationpodcast.com, and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support.